Welcome everybody, both here and uh, whoever's uh, online with us. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, my name is Joe Delegati. I'm with NeuroAlert Monitoring Services, and we welcome you to the business of medicine. Just a little bit of information about NeuroAlert. We are a provider of intraoperative neuromonitoring services for brain and spine surgery, as well as cardiovascular, vascular, and uh, ENT. Um, as a company, we strongly believe in education. And uh, on that front, both clinical education as well as business education. We know that uh, those of you who are physicians and surgeons have many, many opportunities for clinical education, but on the business side, maybe not quite as much. So um, that is the reason why we decided to uh, provide this presentation today. Uh, we have brought together thought leaders across uh, numerous fields in law, uh, accounting, uh, personal finance and wealth management, uh, recruiting. Uh, we'll be having, we have people who will talk a little bit about pri uh, private practice versus uh, hospital practice. Um, and um, you have plenty of time to ask questions and uh, have an opportunity to uh, uh, discuss any topics with them that you may want to explore further. Um, there was an old um, commercial for those of you who are around my age. There may, aren't many of you in the room that are, but uh, if you recall, uh, a clothing company by the name of uh, Cy Sims. And Cy Sims used to say, an educated consumer is our best customer. Uh, we strongly believe that as well, and we were, it's in that vein that we will start off. So uh, I would like to start this day off with uh, our first presenter, Eric Fader. Eric is a partner in the health services practice group of Rifkin Radler. He's represented healthcare providers and other corporate clients in connection with business planning and contractual issues, transactional matters, federal and state regulatory compliance for more than 30 years. Uh, Eric advises on reimbursement issues, matters related to federal and state anti-kickback, self-referral laws, HIPAA, High Tech Act matters, um, Affordable Care Act compliance, hospital privilege, medical staff issues, payer audits, state licensure, and, certifi and certificate of need matters. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Eric Fader. Thanks very much, Joe, and thank you, everybody. Hello in the room. Hello, everybody watching, playing along at home. The situations that I'm going to describe, obviously, are not, ha have not been tailored to anybody in the room. And conversely, anybody in the room or watching online should not try to extrapolate what I say to a specific situation, because in healthcare, particularly in healthcare regulation, there are so many different variations of, of problems and issues that you really need to consult counsel. If you have any sort of uh, federal or state law matter, don't assume that someone else's answer is going to be the same for yours. A little bit about my law firm. We have 180 lawyers in five offices, four in New York and one in New Jersey. Uh, our health services practice group has 24 attorneys, which makes us a pretty large healthcare practice. We can cover the waterfront pretty much anything that you need if you're a healthcare provider or a service provider to a healthcare provider or group. And uh, the other practice areas in the group also support whatever someone is likely to, to need. I always say, except for uh, maritime law or a couple of other obscure specialties, we can, we, can, uh, we can handle pretty much anything you throw at us. So particularly relevant to physicians and uh, and others in the healthcare practice group, uh, others in the, uh, the healthcare industry. We have a very large insurance practice. We handle employment and labor matters, employment contracts, as my colleague Jeff will explain later in the day. Uh, estates matters, any type of litigation, and corporate law and other types of things for startup entities. So for a, uh, for a young physician, an old physician for that matter, we can cover whatever you might need. Rifkin Rounds is our healthcare blog, healthcare law blog. Uh, it's rifkinradler.com slash rifkin.rounds. And on that uh, website, on that blog, you'll find updates on all uh, important healthcare developments, whether they're case law or, or policy changes or, or, or new laws or regulations. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good way to keep up on what's going on in the healthcare field. I, I just want to stress that in healthcare, uh, particularly, but in, in all legal matters, it's a good idea to get all your agreements in writing. 
people don't always recognize that even though you can have a binding agreement that's not in writing, in healthcare particularly, <clears throat> the Stark Law, the anti-kickback statute, other types of healthcare regulations really require that the agreement be in writing. And it's a good idea generally because people's recollections can change, people, people can forget what they agreed on a year or two ago. You can have he said, she said issues when, uh, in trying to enforce an agreement. But in healthcare, the fact that the agreement be in writing is actually a requirement. So in, in many situations. So uh, see a lawyer, get your agreements in writing. And it shouldn't just be any lawyer, like the guy who did your real estate closing, because healthcare is a very specific area. You really need, whether it's someone in my firm, someone in some other firm, someone who understands healthcare law and the layers of regulations that have, that, uh, laws and regulations that have uh, come, been, been laid on top of one another over the last 30 or so years, particularly. Okay. I'm going to talk about the major, uh, a few of the major federal laws that affect the healthcare profession, the healthcare industry, and some state matters as well. The anti-kickback statute is the federal law that I think is most relevant to most physicians most of the time. We're generalizing, but the uh, almost any type of healthcare-related specialty. There's the, the, the key is always going to be getting, getting patients or getting business. And if it is federal program business, either the Medicare program, Medicare, Medicaid, TRICARE, a couple of other types of smaller programs, if it's a federal payer, then there are specific laws that I'm going to talk about now, the, the anti-kickback statute and the Stark law that pertain uh, solely to federal program business, but unlike other types of prohibitions that, that may be enforced on a state level or maybe, or, or maybe uh, a, a commercial payer will, will, will have its own rules, if it's the federal government, you don't want to mess around. You want to comply. You want to make sure you don't trip over any of the prohibitions of the anti-kickback statute or, or the Stark law particularly. I'll talk about Stark next. But the anti-kickback statute says whoever knowing, knowingly and willingly offers to pay any type of remuneration, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, including any kickback, bribe, or rebate in order to induce someone to refer, to refer federal program business, whether it's a patient or uh, in order to induce a purchase of something that's reimbursable under a federal program, uh, that is a felony, and you could have you could have both a civil action against you and a and a criminal. It's also potentially a criminal violation. The I want to highlight a couple of the the, um, the some of the wording in the anti-kickback statute. The payment it doesn't have to be a payment in cash. It doesn't have to be a, a bag of cash. Here's here's ten thousand dollars. Send me patients. It could be a reduction in. Uh, a reduction in what, what you're charging for the service that you're providing. It could be football tickets. It could be anything of value that one healthcare provider or, or even uh, somebody who's not a healthcare provider pays or gives to somebody who he, who he or she thinks can steer patients his way, patients or, or other healthcare business. It could be uh, compensation to a surgeon to, to induce that surgeon to use, a, to order a certain kind of spinal implant or a, a knee implant or, or a drug or device, or it could be a, the referral of the patient per se. Now, two things to stress about the anti-kickback statute. First of all, it's intent-based. So if, uh, if you, if there's a potential violation of the anti-kickback statute, and logically, there's no way that, that the parties involved in the exchange of value, whatever it was, it could be said to have done that for the purpose of, of referring or obtaining a referral of a patient, then that's a defense. 
whereas the, the Stark Law that I'll talk about in a minute is, is what's called a strict liability statute. If you violate it, then you violated it. The anti-kickback statute, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about some specific situations that may or may not violate uh, the anti-kickback statute. I'm going to say AKS from this point on for, for simplicity. But the, the AKS, like I said, it's intent-based. If, if you can prove that you didn't intend to, to pay a bribe or a kickback or a rebate, then that's a defense to the allegation. In addition to the prohibition on offering or paying a, a bribe or kickback, there's also a similar prohibition against soliciting or receiving um, a payment like that. Okay, so here's some real world examples that, that I picked out that are particularly applicable to physicians and other people in the healthcare field. Advisory boards. Very often a physician will be asked by, uh, by the manufacturer of a piece of equipment that he may use in his, in his practice. Partic this is particularly applicable to surgeons or uh, maybe a pharmaceutical manufacturer. We'd like you to be on our advisory board and of course you'll be compensated for your time. That's okay so far. If you're actually providing services, if you're actually attending advisory board meetings or if you're actually participating in conference calls, that's great. And surgeons and other physicians can be very highly compensated. The hourly value of their time is higher than than the average uh, babysitter, so it's possible for these companies to compensate the physicians for their time. But you can't say, I'm a big pharma, uh, manu pharmaceutical manufacturer, and you're a potential user of, of my, uh, prescriber of my drugs, and therefore I'd like to pay you $10,000 to be on my advisory board, but you don't have to actually do anything. That's a kickback. Somebody's going to go to jail. You can't do that. Same thing with, uh, m with a, a maker of uh, devices that are used in surgeries like knee implants or spine implants. Uh, you're, you're a surgeon, you, you, you like my product, right? Yeah, I love your product. How'd you like to be on my advisory board? Okay, great. It's gotta be the, the payment, the compensation for being on the advisory board has to be the fair market value of the service that you are actually providing for that manufacturer or vendor. That's, I think that's probably the number one cautionary tale among, among, uh, among potential surgeons. Compensating third-party marketers is another, one, another uh, thing to generally be careful with. If you, uh, healthcare is a very highly regulated uh, field, as, as everybody knows, I think. If you have a... Uh, uh, pick any business. If you own a gas station and you want to pay someone to get people to to come to your gas station or use your service facility or whatever it is, and you want to compensate them on a success basis, that's fine. In healthcare, however, that doesn't work. You can't compensate a, a, a marketer who is not your actual employee on a success basis because that will be considered a kickback. So a third-party marketer, someone who you don't actually employ, has to be paid either on a fixed, uh, a fixed basis, preferably a monthly fee of whatever it is, $3,000, $5,000, whatever the, the true value of the service that's being provided is, that's what they can get. Or alternatively, if that marketing person uh, will, will give you a, a, an invoice, a monthly invoice perhaps, saying uh, in detail, these are the things that I did this, pre this past month, I spent eight hours or I spent 10 hours and you recite what, what the marketer did, the marketer gets blank dollars per hour, you pay the invoice once a month, that's also acceptable. But a success fee saying I'll pay you $1,000 for every patient you refer to me for a surgery, that is clearly a violation of the federal anti-kickback statute. Joint ventures, that's another, another hot topic, particularly uh, in New Jersey, among, uh, among other states at the moment, uh, I'll say why in a minute, uh, service providers and uh, vendors to physicians will sometimes offer the physician or the medical group the opportunity to participate in what they call a joint venture. You can, you can, we're going to form a company and you can be in a shareholder or a partner in it and we'll be a partner in it and that way every time you buy something from 
from us, whether it's, again, a, a medical device or a service, you get to share in the profits from that. It's, it's also, it's not, it's not legal. It's another, it's going to be uh, basically a kickback for, considered a kickback for, um, for that, uh, for making that patient referral or, or buying that piece of equipment or, or that service. The, the reason that this is very significant right now in New Jersey, particularly in the intraoperative monitoring field, is that New Jersey has a state self-referral prohibition that I'll talk about later, but there's an exception to the law for referrals by surgeons to intraoperative monitoring companies of which they own a piece. So for, uh, companies in other states have all of a sudden, the last few years, rushed into New Jersey, offering New Jersey surgeons the opportunity to participate in these so, quote unquote joint ventures and they are of questionable legality and, and, and we'll, we'll talk about state law later. Gifts. Uh, very often a referring physician will, will, have, uh, will have someone come in and want to buy, I'm going to treat your office to lunch, I'm going to buy pizzas for your office, I'm going to give everybody a bottle of wine at Christmas time, I'm going to give everybody, invite everybody to a party, I'm going to invite people to a football game or basketball game or whatever. If the value of, it, of an individual gift exceeds $10, which doesn't get you very far, that is potentially uh, considered a violation of the federal anti-kickback statute. There's not a lot of enforcement right now. There's nobody running around auditing whether, whether if you bought Pizzas for the, for the staff in, of a referring physician's office. If, you, if you're a surgeon and you want to get, or, or a specialist, if you want to get referrals from a referring physician, you want the people in the office to like you. You want you might want to buy them lunch or something. So a pizza is clearly okay. A chicken parmesan hero is probably okay because that's under ten dollars a person. Also, uh, you know, rack of lamb for everybody. Technically, it might be a violation of the anti-kickback statute. It's really silly. Like I said, there's nobody running around auditing, uh, auditing these, these receipts, but the point is that gifts that exceed either $10 per person per event or $50 per person in a given year are potentially considered a violation of the anti-kickback statute, or at least something that the federal government, if you're doing other things, that could be one piece of the puzzle where the government might say, you are, you are paying people bribes or, or, or kickbacks. It's, uh, again, the, the anti-kickback statute is a, uh, it's an intent-based statute. So if you say, look, there's no way that buying everybody lunch could actually l m coerce them into referring uh, risky spinal surgery cases to me, I think that's a good, a pretty logical defense. If you say nobody in his right mind would be persuaded to send to, to send me business just because I bought them, uh, you know, a ticket to a football game, then that, that's that's probably a, a reasonable defense. But be careful accepting gifts or 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 any anything of value for anybody who wants your business in one way or another. Uh, some other uh, specific potential problems under the anti-kickback statute. Free or deeply discounted services, don't give people free services. If, if you have a, a, a needy patient and you want to reduce your charge to that patient or on a case-by-case -case basis, if you want to waive the payment of co-pays or deductibles, that's okay. Making it a regular practice, however, could be potentially considered a kickback. And even, you, you can pay a kickback to a patient. It, it's the, the statute doesn't just cover one physician or one provider referring to another, it potentially prohibits payments or, or giving something of value to a patient as well. So it's something to be mindful of. The last item on the slide here, I wrote HHS RFI. The Department of Health and Human Services in August of 2018 issued a request for information asking the public, particularly the healthcare industry, how can, how would you suggest we liberalize the anti-kickback statute in order to improve 
the likelihood of care coordination, uh, sharing, sharing information between, from one provider to another to improve patient care, or, or even incentivizing one provider to, to uh, refer a patient to someone within an accountable care organization, for example, in order to, uh, to reduce costs to the system, the healthcare system overall, and to improve coordination of care and value-based payments, as opposed to the, uh, the type of fee-for-service medicine that we have now, where, where the cost of health care is skyrocketing. So the federal government has recognized that the anti-kickback statute, as well as a couple of other statutes that I'll talk about later, may be hindering uh, the health care system functioning effectively. So these, uh, these comments from the public are, are, have been submitted. They're being processed and we may see some softening of the anti-kickback statute requirements over the next year or so. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Stark Law. Now, very often healthcare providers and people in and around the industry, when they say, oh, is this okay under Stark, or is that a Stark violation? The Stark Law, it's actually one specific statute, but people sometimes use it as a shorthand for all federal healthcare regulatory matters. The Stark Law and the Anti-Kickback Statute are two separate sets of requirements, two separate statutes. There can be overlap. You can have a specific situation violate both of them. But very often, as I said, if someone says, oh, is that OK under Stark, maybe they're not talking about the Stark Law. Maybe they mean, oh, could this be considered a kickback? And it, there should be uh, a recognition that there are two separate sets of requirements. and. The exceptions under the Stark Law and the AKS are not always exactly aligned. The Stark Law, while the anti-kickback kickback statute prohibits uh, payments of bribes and kickbacks and rebates, the Stark Law prohibits the actual referral of the patient. It, the referral itself is prohibited. A physician cannot refer a patient to an entity or uh, to another business in which he or she has a financial interest or an ownership interest unless there's an applicable uh, exception. And the definition of physician in, um, uh, in this statute includes chiropractors and dentists. So a physician, a chiropractor, a dentist can't refer a patient to an entity in which he or she has a financial interest or an, or an ownership interest unless there's an available exception. For uh, this again applies only to Medicare and Medicaid patients, and it applies to a list, a specific list of services that are that are prohibited. They're called designated health services or DHS. This in, they include inpatient or outpatient hospital services, so obviously surgeries are included, outpatient prescriptions, durable medical equipment, clinical laboratory services, radiology services like imaging, MRI, uh, ultrasound, CAT scans prosthetics and orthotics, home health services, and dot, dot, dot. There are a few more, like radiation therapy. Does this only apply to Medicare and Medicaid? And yes, that is, that is the case. But the other thing to stress is that there are, there are exceptions to the prohibition, and there are exceptions to the exceptions. So it's very, it can be very complex figuring out whether something is OK or whether it's prohibited. So I'm not going to cover all the exceptions, but just to name a couple, uh, there's something called the in-office ancillary service ex exception. So if I let's, uh, give an example, let's say I'm a radiologist and I have a radiology practice where I see patient diagnostic radiology where I see patients. I'm also a, an owner of an MRI machine, which is in it's in the same building where my office is, and I want to be able to refer patients to it, even though it's under a different um, a, a different legal entity. That's going to be okay if it's in the same building because there's something called the in-office ancillary service exception, which applies not, doesn't have to be actually in, in the same room. It could be at the same address. You could, it could be another office in that same building. There's also a, uh, an exception for services that the referring physician provides or supervises himself. So that's called the physician services exception. And there are some others. So, so it is. Uh, I, I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that that a referral by a physician to, to some an ancillary service entity in which he has an interest is, is illegal. But 
If it's not done right, it could be. If they had the benefit of health care counsel, they probably figured out a way to do it legally. And there are, there are ways around all these prohibitions. But uh, you, you have to be mindful of the prohibitions. If a physician only refers the federal, uh, if the physician has an interest in, in an ancillary service but does not refer the federal program patients to it but participates in Medicare, it is, how does the government look at that? The, the Stark Law prohibition applies only to referrals of patients or, uh, or business for w which are reimbursable under a federal program. So if you participate in Medicare, but you only refer your non-Medicare, uh, uh, to use my previous example, MRIs to the entity in which you, you have an ownership interest, that won't be a Stark Law violation. It could be a violation of of a state analog of the Stark Law, and I'll talk about those in a minute, there, a number of states have adopted what I call mini-Stark laws, which are similar to the Stark Law, but which may apply to all payers, not just federal program payers. But strictly for the purposes of the Stark Law itself, as well as for the anti-kickback statute, we're only talking about uh, services that are reimbursable under a federal program. Now, I'm, I want to stress reimbursable also. If you refer a Medicare patient to an entity in which you have an interest, but you, you figure you're going to be okay if you just don't actually bill Medicare for it, that doesn't work because the services are reimbursable under Medicare or Medicaid even though you don't actually submit a bill. The uh, Stark Law, uh, as I mentioned in, in my little hypothetical, it even applies to two different legal entities that might be owned by the same person. So if I'm a surgeon, I want to refer a patient out of my surgical PC to another PC in which I have an interest or an equity interest or, an, or a financial interest of some kind. With either it, <clears throat> it could even be wholly owned by me. It's potentially technically a Stark Law violation if it's for one of those designated health services and if no exception is available. But the, uh, there, there are plenty of exceptions. There are lots of ways to weave your way through Stark and do this properly. So definitely, uh, when it comes to referring a patient to, to, something, uh, to some other entity for ancillary services, check with a lawyer and make sure that you're doing it OK. Like with the anti-kickback statute, there was a request for information uh, released by the Department of Health and Human Services in 2018. So. Uh, the federal government recognizes that for purposes of care coordination, again, re reducing the cost to the system overall, and for things like accountable care organizations where you want to encourage people referring to different things in which they have an interest to try to improve efficiency, it is likely, I think, that we'll see the Stark Law uh, liberalized, if not, probably not completely eliminated, but, but liberalized at some point over the next year or two. For the past several years, people have been talking about how the Stark Law is really impeding good patient care, and the federal government has recognized this, and I think within sometime this year, I think we'll see some movement on this, as well as with the anti-kickback statute. The other, uh, the, the other major federal um, health care law that people don't really think about very often is the anti-markup rule. This one applies only to Medicare, not to Medicaid. It applies to any time a, a, a medical provider uses an outside supplier who does not share a practice in order to, uh, to provide a service or, or uh, a technical service. It could be a technical service as well. One example is uh, a company that hires a mobile ultrasound provider to go into doctor's offices and, and treat that physician's patients. And there, there, there's usually a contract between the physician whose office the, the company goes into and the company that provides the, the ultrasound. The company that provides the ultrasound can then engage a technologist and maybe they think, uh, maybe the physician whose practice it is thinks I can pay them $20 and I can bill them to Medicare at $40 for a, for a particular service, for an ultrasound service, you can't do that. That's a markup. If it's a Medicare patient, that's potentially a problem. So Medicare, the federal government, can only be billed what 
the practice actually pays to the outside provider of services. Again, this is sort of an oversimplification, but something else to keep an eye on. Okay, state laws. We're going to talk very briefly about state laws because state laws can vary a lot. And since, since I talked a lot about, about the federal anti-kickback statute and, and the federal self-referral statute, State law analogs can be very similar or they can, the, the wording can be different. So you really have to look at it on a state-by-state -state basis. Some, some states have anti-kickback statutes that are similar to the federal anti-kickback statute, but unlike the federal AKS, which is applicable only to Medicare and Medicaid patients, the, the state analogs can be applicable to all payers. Not always, not all states have them, but it could be applicable to commercial uh, to services provided to commercial carrier patients as well. New Jersey has a state anti-kickback statute, for example. New York does not. Uh, some of the other anti-kickback issues also arise under state laws like success-based payments to marketers or independent contractors who provide uh, services to the practice can also be problematic if they involve a, uh, a success-based payment. And th these payments can also violate the, the state fee-splitting prohibition, if there is one. Many states, not all states, have prohibitions against a licensed party sharing revenues from professional services with somebody who doesn't have a license, or sometimes even with another healthcare provider. Even, it could be even, even one licensed person sharing professional fees with another licensed person if it's not done properly. Uh, there, there are ways around this too, or they might be depending on what state it is, but paying a percentage of your collections to a marketing person or to the person, to, to the company that manages your office or to your billing company, these types of percentage-based fees are problematic. And even in New York where there are still a lot of, tr traditionally most billing companies used to charge a certain percentage of collections, and, and many of them still do. Th these are technical violations of the state's fee-splitting prohibition, although there has not really been any enforcement the last couple of decades. There hasn't been much. It's still potentially problematic. Okay, some other state law issues. As I mentioned before, in New Jersey, there is an analog to the Stark Law that's called the Cody Law that pro pro prohibits a physician from referring a patient to another entity in which he has he or she has a financial interest or an ownership interest. Uh, re relevant to our, uh, to our sponsors today, uh, NeuroAlert and other intraoperative monitoring companies, it is not prohibited in New Jersey for a surgeon to have an interest in an intraoperative monitoring company, but it has to be done properly. So even if, e even if you have uh, some, some intraoperative monitoring company that says, I'd like to partner with you, uh, the surgeon, and, and you get to refer patients to your own company to provide intraoperative monitoring services. It's not technically a violation of New Jersey law, but if it's done improperly, as right now some out of state, out of New Jersey companies are doing, it could potentially be a violation of the Cody law. The corporate practice of medicine is another typical type of state prohibition. Uh, a a physician or other healthcare provider cannot provide, generally cannot provide services through an entity that is owned by people who don't have that license or who, who are not professionals of one kind or another. A lot of different variations of this, but one, one situation where this arises is a management company that thinks it can run a practice. Like uh, Aspen Dental got into trouble with the New York State Attorney General a few years ago for exerting too much control over uh, its, its chain of dental practices. I think it had about 40 of them in the state of New York. And it was also uh, getting paid a percentage of the, the collections of these practices for the management services and the billing services that it was providing. And, and also for, for, for other, for supplies that it was selling to these companies, so, to these practices. So, uh, if you're a physician or other health care provider, you are supposed to be in charge of patient care. You're not supposed to allow 
a, a, manage, a management company or anybody else who doesn't have a license from dictating how your practice is run. The office, I just mentioned on the slide, the Office of Professional Medical Conduct. I'm not going to go into any detail about OPMC, except that it is the, the agency within the Department of Health in the state of New York that governs professional practice. So if you violate any of these statutes, if you get a letter from the OPMC saying, we understand that you are doing X, Y, or Z, call a lawyer. You don't want to go to a hearing at the Office of Professional Medical Conduct without proper legal advice. And I put another bullet on the slide for residency issues. Sometimes people may think, well, uh, nobody's going to bother me. I'm just a resident, and I think it's OK for me to do this or that. M at my firm, we've represented a couple of residents who, who got in trouble with their hospitals. Or uh, in one situation, there was a different, a different problem that, that came before OPMC, even though they weren't actually in private practice yet. So uh, you've got to follow the laws, whether you're actually out in practice or whether you're still in your residency. A discussion of HIPAA is really beyond the scope of, of my talk here. I, I, uh, I, I didn't leave a lot of time for it. I just want to point out that patient privacy and the, the security of protected health information of your patients is, again, I, I, could, I could talk about HIPAA, HIPAA for hours. Just be aware that uh, that the federal government the last couple of years has really been cracking down on, on HIPAA violations. And I have on the slide a number of little bullet points to think about. But uh, again, I, I won't go into detail now. Just treat HIPAA, take HIPAA very seriously. Of all the federal laws that are applicable to, uh, to the healthcare industry, HIPAA is the one everybody's heard the word, but a lot of people misunderstand what it entails. And surprise bills, my last point. The, uh, there has been a, a trend the last couple of years, and it's, it's uh, e even to the point where Donald Trump came out with something on this a couple of days ago. To, uh, people want to try to eliminate uh, surprise bills, which generally means, uh, it generally refers to an out-of-network bill from a provider who the patient wasn't really aware was out of network or wasn't informed they would be getting a bill from. This comes up most often in a situation where a patient's in the hospital for surgery, the hospital is in the patient's uh, health care, uh, health insurer's network, but maybe the anesthesiologist is not, or maybe another ancillary provider is not. So they get a bill from the anesthesiologist. It's an out-of-network bill. It's higher than they thought. And they say, well, if I had been informed of this, I would have chosen, maybe I would have chosen another hospital where the anesthesiologists are, all, are, are in network and I would have gotten much lower bills. This is not the same as balance billing, which is patients having to pay the, uh, their copay or their, um, or, or their deductible. These are, again, generally out of network charges which exceed what the patient would have to pay if the provider uh, was in network and a number of states have adopted these prohibitions already there's probably going to be a federal prohibition coming down the pike sometime again maybe sometime this year because the problem has been recognized thanks very much